Good evening. Good evening. My name is Emily Lopez. I'm a volunteer coordinator with A Faith That Does Justice. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight, and our meeting will be starting shortly. Um, if you are in the room and don't have a name badge or haven't registered, please go to the registration desk um, so that we can get your information and you can get a name badge. Um, we want to point out a few just housekeeping um, items with the restrooms are out this exit door and that does serve as an emergency exit there, the door that you came in and the door over on this side as well. Um, I'd also like to point out that we do have some resource tables here tonight. Um, if you haven't visited already, hopefully toward the end of the program, you can stop by. Um, we have a table uh, where someone will be to give you information on volunteering uh, with a faith that does justice, as well as with our um, ESOL classes uh, where we're registering students and looking for teachers as well. Um, we want to thank the Sunrise Movement and the Boston Catholic Movement for participating in our community meeting and for the resources that they are providing on climate change. Um, please do visit those tables in this back corner of the room when the meeting is done. Um, we would also be very grateful for your financial support of our organization. Um, we have community meetings during the course of the year and also workshops during the course of the year. Um, there will be a donation table at the back of the room as well, um, and we would take uh, donations in the form of cash or check or um, card reader. Um, we would ask people to please take your seats, and our program will begin in just a few moments. Thank you. Good evening. We want to welcome all in the room with us tonight, and we would like to give a special welcome to our streaming audience as well. Um, please request, we request that you like 
our event on Facebook. Um, share it with your friends, um, streaming audience. Please like and share. And we encourage the streaming audience um, to send comments and questions in the chat window. Uh, there will be some time allocated during the question and answer session later on this evening um, to take um, questions from online via the chat host. Uh, we will also accept questions via Twitter and Facebook, and we encourage people to live tweet um, the event using the hashtag um, AFTDJ community. Um, we as always, as I mentioned, we welcome your financial support of our organization um, as it helps uh, fund and grow all of our programs, our community meetings, and our English um, for Speakers of Other Languages program. Um, right now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Father Peter Jives, the founder and director of A Faith That Does Justice. Thank you. Well, thank you and, and good evening to everyone. Uh, we're delighted that you're here. We think tonight's topic is really crucial to our future, to the children that we leave um, this world to. And um, I'd like to just take a moment to welcome both you as well as our streaming audience and to let you know that uh, we can be followed uh, if you're not uh, in town or following things on our webpage. Uh, so tonight's topic will have the title, The Effect of the Environmental Crisis on the Poor and Vulnerable. We have what we believe is an excellent uh, group of panelists who will come and speak to us, and I'll introduce them in just a moment. But before I do that, uh, the topic tonight, you know, we really, I think we're gonna hear something about to just uh, maybe put this in a context is, um, there is debate by some about the scientific validity of uh, the environmental uh, change. And I think we're gonna hear something to that effect of really uh, debunking that kind of uh, mentality. Hopefully we'll hear something about the effects of the environmental changes on the poor and the vulnerable. Uh, not surprisingly, the people who are affected most by climate change are people who are really suffering in different parts of the world and even in this country. Uh, we'll also hear hopefully something about action. What can we do nationally? What can we do as individuals? And with that in mind, at all of our talks, we try to bring uh, kind of an action table where we have people from the community who are really working on the issue that we're talking about tonight. And we have the, um, the Sunrise Boston movement at one of the tables back there raising his hand. Ben, that's a youth climate action change group. And we also have the Boston Catholic Climate Movement, which is linked to, for many of the Catholics here or Christians perhaps, uh, two years ago, uh, uh, Pope Francis issued what they call an encyclical called Laudato Si, where what was unusual about it is that oftentimes these encyclicals of the Catholic Church are written internally. Occasionally they're written to the entire world, and this one was, where Pope Francis said that climate change is not about a religious belief. It's really about all human beings and the, the common stake we have in preserving the environment to be able to hand it on and protect it as stewards of that environment. Uh, so our, uh, uh, the Boston Catholic Climate Group is also here and they will uh, uh, be available for any kinds of questions that you may have at the end of the meeting. If you're interested in getting more involved, these two groups may be able to point you in the right direction. Before we start, I just want to say something very quickly about this group. Uh, I'm a Jesuit priest and I'm a physician. And this group really came out of an experience I had in Latin America now about 30 years ago where I worked as a physician in the midst of a civil war in Central America. And the injustice that I saw was so rampant that it was difficult to really uh, tolerate, to see. And in the aftermath of that, I was not a priest at that time. I became a priest really because of the witness of the people that I saw in that country, both the poor who really were trying to work for a world that would be more just for their children, and also the religious people of that country, be them Catholic, be them uh, non-Catholic Christians or other groups that really worked for societal change where there could be justice, not just for some, but for all God's people. It was a powerful, powerful experience, and it, quite frankly, transformed my own life. I left the work I was doing at that time as a researcher at the National Institute of Health, and really since that time have been working uh, 
uh, on this kind of an idea. This group of faith that uh, does justice is really my attempt to really offer back to people in perhaps a first world setting something of that experience of what goes on in a world where so many people are being left behind for a number of different reasons. This group tries to reach out and to try and take different topics periodically and to get expert speakers as we have tonight and to try to raise consciousness about what is going on in this world in which we live today, what is going on in this very country in which we live, where there really is rampant injustice. Uh, so that's really the intent. We do it in three ways. One is what we call workshops. They tend to be more faith-based topics. For example, what do the Jewish prophets from the Hebrew scriptures have to say to us today? That's a topic we had recently. The idea of that is really to challenge people to recognize that their faith, be it Muslim, Christian, Jewish, whatever it is, we're called beyond the temple, the mosque, or the church to live our faith in society. The second uh, component of this is what we're doing tonight. We call them community meetings, and they're really uh, larger meetings here held at this Marriott Hotel where we try to take a topic of social justice, a topic that affects vulnerable people around the world and, quite frankly, here in Boston as well. The final thing, uh, I was advised early on that we needed to have an action component to really make this sustainable. And what we run is what we call uh, English for Speakers of Other Languages, often referred to as ESOL. We run that out of uh, St. Anthony's Shrine in Arch Street, downtown Boston. That program is open to recently arrived people. It is free to them so that they can gain the language skills, English language skills that will make life easier for them in this country, both on daily living as well as job placement. It is uh, perhaps not surprising, but there's a direct correlation with English language skills and pay within the uh, job market. So our program, we are uh, aligned with Jewish vocational services. For those who may not know, it would be somewhat the equivalent of Catholic charities. The only difference is Jewish vocational services has about 100 times the amount of money to run their operation. It, Jewish people, as you may know, very philanthropic. That program or that operation, JVS, is, is quite remarkable. And they've allowed us to get in and piggyback into some of their work. What we hope to do is raise the language skills of some of our recently arrived people, and then we can shuttle them into JVS has a job placement program, where once the language skills get up at a certain level, they can help these people find jobs that really affect their, uh, their lives within their families with better pay and better opportunity, quite frankly. So it is in some respects a justice component to what we're doing. Um, we receive no money from the Catholic Church or from any or organized religious group, and we really are dependent upon people like you to help support us to run this kind of a program to really live adult faith. Faith lived in action. Faith lived beyond the temple, the mosque, or the church. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, invite our panelists to come up, and as they do that, I just set the stage for tonight. The panel will speak for about 45 minutes, kind of an internal dialogue as a way of raising, please come on up, uh, a way of raising consciousness uh, for us. When they finish after about 45 minutes, we're going to have about seven, eight minutes at the tables. There is a, uh, a piece of, you have a flyer at your table asking you to discuss very quickly uh, among yourselves possibilities of what went on tonight, what you think of what went on, and what perhaps you can do. And after that, then we'll have about a half hour of questions from the audience to our panelists. I think this should be proved to be a, a really quite an interesting evening, an educational evening. And with that, I will introduce our panel. We have our moderator right immediately uh, uh, on your complete right would be Aaron Bernstein, who is a physician with a master's in public health. He is the interim director of climate change at the Harvard T.H. Uh, uh, Chan School of Public Health with an interest in this. It's a center for climate health and global environment. Uh, to, in, in our center, we have uh, Renee Salas. And Renee is also a physician with an MPH. She's a clinical instructor in emergency medicine at the Harvard Medical School and an emergency room uh, physician at Mass General Hospital. And finally, all the way to your right, we have um, uh, 
Dr. William Kalin, who is a Nobel laureate. He has just won the uh, Nobel Prize for Medicine or Physiology in the year 2019. And he has agreed to be with us tonight and to really offer some of his own insight. So we are delighted uh, with the panel. And with that, I'd like to turn the discussion over to uh, Dr. Bernstein. And uh, we will reconvene in about 45 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to have the opportunity to be with you this evening and not make your eardrums <laughs> go numb at the same time. Uh, our uh, structure, as you heard, is pretty straightforward. We're each gonna take a few minutes, uh, each of the panelists, to give some opening remarks. We'll have a short discussion, um, and then it'll be your turn to you know, sit with those at your table and think of the questions that you want to raise, and we'll spend some time addressing those. Uh, I, I can say that in the scope of the things that I do every day related to climate change, which, um, as you heard, is a large part of what I do every day, um, opportunities like these are, are far too seldom. And so I really do appreciate the chance to be here with you this evening. Um, I'm gonna give uh, Dr. Salas the opportunity to speak first and uh, turn it over to you, Renee. Thank you very much, Ari. Also want to reiterate that it's such an honor and privilege to be here tonight with all of you and especially these esteemed panelists. Yes. <laughs> Let's see, how are we doing? I can look back at my, my tech folk back there too. We're good? Hear me better? Great. Uh, so I discovered climate change in health about seven years ago. And I think we all have those moments in our life where you realize that God had sort of created that path leading up to these moments that are forks in the road. And so I learned about climate change and I could not imagine working on anything else and realized that it was my God-given passion but I also was alarmed to realize that it was really the first time that I had been hearing about climate change. And the way I heard about it was that it was framed as a public health emergency. And so I actually met with Ari um, shortly after that. Um, he's been a esteemed mentor of mine and decided to direct my career towards that. And the more I learned, it resonated with every piece of my being, myself as a Christian, as a doctor, as a public health expert, and as someone who really restores my soul in nature and in the world around me. But I also work in an emergency department at Massachusetts General Hospital, and I have the honor and privilege of caring for the, the breadth of humanity there. And I was clearly seeing that climate change impacts the vulnerable disproportionately. And we also serve as a safety net often in emergency departments and often care for those populations that are being impacted the greatest. And so one of the many hats that I wear, because I've had the ability now to sort of focus solely on climate change and health um, over the past, about two years ago, is I serve as the first author on uh, Lancet Countdown uh, policy brief for the United States. So the Lancet is one of the world's leading journals and they very early recognized the need to commit effort to this issue. And so they created something called the Lancet Countdown, which is really looking to track how climate change is impacting health and how solutions are being implemented around the globe. So they also give us data then for the United States, which we turn into a brief. And this brief was just released in November, but we focus solely on the issue of health equity and the fact that climate action is actually action to create a just world for equal opportunity for everyone. And if I also make the plug, because it could be informed kind of discussions, that we created a, what I hope is to be a pretty easily accessible diagram to try to highlight how different susceptibilities and vulnerabilities exist for different people. And so we kind of talk about the course of four different individuals who live in a city and how they're impacted by a heat wave and how that impacts their health. And I won't dive into kind of all the depth of it, but just talking about that certain people have increased susceptibility, meaning that because of their age, uh, for example, children and the elderly are more impacted um, because if people have certain medical conditions like asthma or otherwise, that they're inherently more susceptible. Some people are also more exposed, so exposure is an issue depending on where you live. You can imagine if you're poor and live in a top floor apartment with poor insulation and you can't afford air conditioning, 
you're going to live in very different exposure to heat than people who have means and are able to uh, have always go from air conditioned building to air conditioned building. And the last one is sort of their ability to adapt. So do you have the tools to actually try to adapt to this changing world? So we kind of highlight different pieces, but another one is sort of we talked about is air pollution. And if you think about what's driving climate change, it's largely the combustion of fossil fuels, which is also creating air pollution. And so we highlight some data that has, was released recently showing that blacks and Latinx are disproportionately exposed to air pollution and that they actually contribute less to the problem. So they're again, disproportionately bearing the burden. So as a doctor, um, nothing's harder for me than having a patient in front of me that I don't have a treatment for. But thankfully we have the treatment for this. We know how to decrease our reliance on fossil fuels. We just need the political will to implement it. And I think the other piece is that as an emergency doctor, I frequently am in situations where a patient is crashing in front of me and we give that patient every treatment that might save their life. And it's the same thing here. We need to work on multiple fronts, not only learning how to protect the vulnerable and help them to be able to adapt, but also to get to the root cause of this and so decreasing fossil fuels. And so it's really important too, and the thing that I love most about this is the ability to engage across sectors, which is why this discussion is so important. And that what brings me hope around this is the fact that it's bringing people together to have conversations. And nothing brings people together like an enormous challenge. And I can't think of a greater one. And I'm excited to have the conversation tonight. Thank you, Renee. Professor King. So uh, I, I think I'm here because there might have been a late cancellation for this panel. <laughs> And I had gone to uh, St. Cecilia, which is unusual because I used to go to St. Clement, but I went to St. Cecilia and I, I heard this very moving sermon from Father Peter, who during the course of the sermon uh, revealed that he was a physician and a physician scientist in an earlier life. So I went up after the mass to introduce myself and uh, he, he was telling me about this movement and he had just lost a, a speaker. So I said, well, I won the Nobel Prize last month. <laughs> I, I can't remember whether he did this or, or simply said, well, that qualifies. So uh, having qualified for the panel, uh, I'm your third uh, panelist. Now, uh, I would immediately point out, you may have noticed it was a Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine. It wasn't physiology or medicine or climate science. But uh, I am a scientist, and I know something about the scientific uh, method, and so I've been watching with great uh, interest uh, the, the climate change uh, debate. And I remember, for example, being very moved by the, the, the movie An Inconvenient Truth, if you remember that movie, and I remember the wonderful book by Thomas Friedman, Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Uh, I've been a member of the National Academy of Sciences for many years, and I've been watching the reports come out you know, almost every other year on just how much concern there is in the scientific community about climate change. And, and frankly, the more I learned about uh, climate change, the more I began to fear that I've devoted 30 plus years of my life to first treating patients and then trying to understand disease and then trying to develop new therapies for diseases. But I do say in my darker days, I worry that we'll look back and say, you know, that was like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, you were worried about these, these diseases, but in fact, you were all about to go eventually off a cliff. So, I've become pretty passionate about uh, this, and again, with the disclaimer, I'm not a climate scientist, but I, I think I do know something about science and scientists and the scientific methods. And so, and so uh, for example, I wrote a piece called Hot, Flat, and oh, sorry, I'm, I'm taking credit for Thomas Friedman's book, excuse me, uh, uh, cl Climate Change, What Would Lincoln Do?, which was referring to Abraham Lincoln, and this appeared in the Journal of the American uh, Medical Association. Uh, and it started out by, you know, if you know anything about science and scientists, uh, most of the denier arguments are actually laughable on their face, and we may, we may return to that. But I, I will admit, part of writing this was sort of cathartic for me. It did culminate in what is underappreciated, which is that the National Academy of Sciences, which, by the way, I think you helped pay for, uh, was created by Abraham Lincoln in the 19th century because he realized occasionally policymakers 
would need to make decisions based on science. And so we created a place where hopefully the best science, scientists in the country could convene and outside of the political bubble, provide the, the best information with which to make wise decisions. So the irony is, I mean, last time I checked, Lincoln was a Republican. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, Lincoln, if he uh, listened to the National Academy of Sciences and we had climate change during his day, would have said, we got to do something. We can't just hope that, you know, uh, that most of the scientists are wrong. Uh, I think uh, maybe one of the most important things I can do, uh, how many of you have a friend or family member who you would say is otherwise intelligent and well-educated but is a climate change denier? Any, anybody other than me? Right? I, and, and frankly, at least in my family, I, I, you know, we've, we've decided this is off limits. You don't discuss this at Thanksgiving dinner because it gets really heated very quickly. Now, I, I, having grown up as a Catholic and having gone to Catholic school, you know, Catholics are pretty good at, you know, da, da. so some of you might be, some of, some of you might be thinking, this is your fault. If, if you, if you, were, you know, if you made a stronger argument, you know, if you were more articulate, more thoughtful, you'd, you'd flip these deniers. And the fact that they're not changing their mind is, is your fault. So, well, I, I'm here to tell you, I, I have the same experience. So, so my non-scientific Friends and family members will tell me, Bill, you don't, you don't understand. You know, I did just win the Nobel Prize. I mean, you know, it, you know I don't understand how science gets done. I, I've been brainwashed. Uh, it's because I live in Massachusetts. This is a liberal conspiracy to redistribute wealth, and you're just not getting it, okay? And, and so they, they, they feel sorry for me. And, and, and so, uh, again, I think I, I'm actually to a point where uh, you know, we can debate whether it's efficient to try to flip and change the minds of the deniers in sort of this tribal period we're living in. Uh, that's the bad news. I, I think, hopefully during our discussion, I'm, I'm hopeful about some other things I think we actually can do uh, that might be more positive and uh, more efficient than fighting with our family members and friends at the Thanksgiving dinner table, because at least that hasn't worked well for me so far. You'll keep us posted. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Thank you both. I'll, I'll just take a minute. Um, before I do, I want to remind my fellow panelists that even though I've been charged with asking you questions, you should feel free to ask me questions. Um, you know, I think in the context of the conversation this evening, the things that I would say have been underscored already um, by Renee and Bill, which is this is arguably one of the most fundamental justice and equity issues that we've ever dealt with. And so, from a faith perspective, it is, in my mind, so well in sync with the ideals that come with a whole suite of um, religious identities. And uh, it also challenges our social structures to the core because people we all know, I mean, so many people raise their hand that are near and dear to us, may not talk to us, <laughs> uh, it's, it's taboo. And, and so uh, many of you in the questions you asked as you signed up for this event said, you know, how do we talk about this in a, in a way that's productive? And, and so I, I think, you know, when I said these events are too seldom in my life, I, I, I genuinely believe faith is a very important part of this conversation, not just in this country, uh, but around the world. Um, the other piece that I think is critical in my mind about the faith perspective as it comes to climate change is, is the embedded nature of empathy in most, um, in most religions in the world. We, we often talk about empathizing, as Renee alluded to, with those who don't have the ability to protect themselves from the harms that climate change is bringing. And if you want to know about the harms, we can talk about the harms when, when we have Q&A. Um, but the part that increasingly is on my mind these days is that it turns out that the lights are on in this room, uh, not by malfeasance, uh, but by people who are doing all of us a service in harnessing fossil fuels, largely in poor communities in this country and largely without any opportunity to do anything else. And those of us do-gooders who want to change the world often forget that these people exist. And we, in my view, have a wonderful path forward, which I will talk about in a minute, about the opportunities that sit in front of us that we can grab onto and advance health gains on issues that have been enormously difficult for the likes of us to deal with in a hospital or a clinic. Uh, 
by doing what we need to do with climate change. Not sure if that's a phone. I think everyone's phone is now yeah. ringing with some alert. Amber alert. Uh, so the point I was making before we had our Amber alert is that the thing that I don't want us to forget as we pursue these solutions, which I think are, are, are more than worthy pursuing, is that we can't expect change to happen when we leave people behind in the process, right? And that means everybody. And people talk about how there's more jobs in renewables in the United States than there is in something like coal and oil, which is true, and that the growth in those sectors is true. But there are still hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people whose existence depends on getting the fuels that are turning the lights on in this room. And when we talk about this new world we want to move to, which doesn't use fossil fuels and has health benefits, what they hear is, I think, a part of what we've heard at the Thanksgiving dinner in some way, shape, or form, which is we're ignoring them. And they're just, in many cases, as poor as the vulnerable people we're trying to protect otherwise. And in many cases, they have just as little opportunity. So um, this conversation about climate change and faith and empathy is, is such a crucial part of what I think those who have deep belief um, uh, can contribute, which is, in my view, something we need much more of in, in this conversation. Um, so let me um, use my moderator's prerogative here and, and open up with a question to uh, Renee. It was, I've known Renee, as she alluded to, for a while now. And uh, um, I've heard this story that she told you in, in, in many parts, but not entirely. And it, I hope you found it as compelling as, as I find it. Um, but what I want to ask you in, in this context is your faith, as important as it is to you, could have been expressed in medicine in any number of ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, climate change is certainly an important issue. And, and I think it would be interesting to maybe explain a little more about the, the specific things that you came across that you saw as opportunities. I mean, you gave us a good rationale as to how you got here. Mm -hmm. But looking forward with all of the career you have ahead of you, how do you see your faith playing out there? Is that a fair question? Yeah. I mean, I get to put you on the spot. You We're do. sitting on a panel. <laughs> We all have things that guide our life, and my faith is sort of that has is that bedrock and has been a building bedrock for me as I've gone through this process. And so, for me, I think as a Christian, I there we've been I've been given mandates, um, and so I'm supposed to be a steward of the earth, and I'm also supposed to care for the less fortunate. And I think that was really a, a large reason that drove me to emergency medicine, because I love the fact that I can have a professional sports player next to a homeless individual in my emergency department, and I get to treat anyone who walks through that door. And it's a, you know, as you alluded to, I mean, I think being a physician is, it's a profound responsibility to interact with our fellow men and women at their period of greatest need. And I mean, there are so many, you know, cases and stories that I have that, you know, kind of stick with me through that. Um, I mean, there's a recent one that I've, I've shared before, but I think is important here. And there's, a, I was working an overnight shift here in Boston. We're in the middle of a record breaking heat wave and the emergency technicians or EMS uh, ambulance crew kind of wheeled in an elderly man. And he had sort of this listed chief complaint of fever. Well, I was looking at him and he was confused. You could tell he was hallucinating. And uh, I was talking to the ambulance crew to really try to figure out what environment this individual came from. And it turns out his wife called 911 because he was enormously confused. And they said that when they opened the door, I knew one of the ambulance uh, uh, 
crew members really well. And he's like, oh, it was like the Sahara Desert when I opened the door, like this wave of heat just hit them. And they said that when they walked in, I mean, they were on the top floor of a poorly insulated building, no air conditioning, and they had one window that was partially cracked. So they transported this man, leaving, you know, his wife was left at home. But we, so you, if you try to get a, you know, a, a temperature externally, so, you know, you, a lot of times they have those fancy thermometers where they kind of do the wave thing over the forehead. I'm sure you've had it at your primary care doctors. But it's not always accurate about what the true temperature is. And so actually doing a rectal temperature so um, is the most sensitive way or the best way to really figure out what the true temperature is. And this individual had a, a rectal temperature of a, nearly 106 degrees Fahrenheit. So that, with his confusion, is our diagnosis for what we call heat stroke, which is the deadliest form of, of, of heat illness. And it can kill people. And even if people recover, often they die earlier than their counterparts, and uh, there's kind of a whole host of, of issues. And you know, the elderly and older individuals are definitely more at risk for this. So we sort of diagnosed that and then rapidly uh, tried to cool him. But you know, you think about like my interaction with that individual and with his family and other kind of you know families like that. I mean, and that's a moment, right, that that family will remember for the rest of their life. And so, you know, we have this opportunity to engage and act as, again, whatever faith tradition it is that you operate with, if any, you know, to operate within that realm as we interact with those around us. And so, but if I think about what brings people to my emergency department, like I get to treat people, which is a, an honor and a privilege, but I also have to think about what brings them to my door. And so it's hard for me not to look upstream and think about, you know, there's that kind of age old story where, you know, people see um, people floating down a river. And so they're the people, right, who you grab the, you know, there's individuals who are grabbing people out of the river one at a time, which is very important. Um, there are people like, how can I grab more people out of the river at once? Like maybe I'll use a, a tree branch and I'll get, you know, five at a time instead of one at a time. But then there's the individual who's like, let me go upstream and figure out who's throwing people into the river to begin with, right? So I think my opportunity I saw was that if to try to make a difference um, and operate on something that gets to caring for, again, the earth and caring for those less, that are less fortunate, I had to go upstream and this was the way I was called to go upstream. Thank you. Bill, I'd also like to pick up on something you mentioned, which is potentially some opportunities that you've come across in this conversation and would love for you to elaborate on that point. Yeah. So before I, I, I do that, and I will do that, I think since the words faith and belief have come up several times already, I, I think it is worth uh, at least pointing out a few of the ways we perhaps unknowingly got to this world where everything was either black mm. or white and people were fighting at the Thanksgiving dinner table. So I think a lot of people have pointed out that even saying, I believe in climate change, and I, be, you know, I, I believe man is contributing, that spills over pretty quickly to, you know, I believe in the Easter Bunny, right? So then people don't understand that there's a difference when a scientist says, I believe this is happening because of X, Y, or Z. Uh, similar uh, considerations apply to the word theory. You know, it's one thing for me to say, my theory is the Red Sox didn't have enough pitching last year. It's another to say that based on everything we know today, the, the one model that explains all of the observations is this theory. And by the way, the next thing that would happen is hundreds of scientists around the world would try to poke holes at that theory, as they should, doing additional experiments to see if maybe the theory is wrong. But over and over, this idea that you know, CO2 is contributing to, to the climate change we're experiencing has, has, has withstood various uh, tests. So I think that's you know, really important. The language we, we use uh, matters, and I think the final thing I will say is, I, I mentioned an inconvenient truth, with it, which I suspect most of you saw, but uh, the unfortunate thing about the inconvenient truth, I think in my mind and a lot of people's minds, was that the narrator was A, a politician, and B, God forbid, it was a Democrat. Because this should have been a non-political discussion, but what this did was it dovetailed into, frankly, an inherent distrust of centralized big government and people telling us how to live their lives to a now broader distrust for centralized authority and science and people telling us how we should live, live our lives. So, so, so now for more hopeful things, uh, I'll give you two. 
Uh, the one I'm quite hopeful about is uh, there's something called the Environmental Voter Project. Have many of you heard of the Environmental Voter Project? It was started by Nathaniel Stinnett. I think this is brilliant. So his argument along the lines of what I was just saying is uh, changing people's minds, uh, especially in the world we're living in today, is very expensive and very time consuming. So his idea was uh, let's use uh, modern analytics to find people who, had they voted, would have listed environmental causes as number one or number two. And he makes several observations which I think are irrefutable. The first is uh, politicians can find out who votes, and if you do not vote, you are absolutely invisible to them. They do not care. And that already gets rid of like 40% or more of people. They're just simply non-voters. Now, amongst the people who they know vote, they look at polls and, you know, people usually put one, two, or three, the economy, defense, whatever. Uh, until recently, the environment came in at like 10 or 11 or 12. Now it's up to six or seven. So we're, we're getting there. But it's not. So his premise was using modern analytics, you could find people who would, who it, had they voted, would have said the environment is number one or number two. As they tested their models, they discovered two things. There are millions of such people. And the models are so good that they decided, let's forget about the people where it was number two. Because there are lots of people who, had they voted, would have said the environment is number one. Uh, then they use modern behavioral techniques to try to get some of these people to vote, and in some cases become super voters, and that includes things like uh, text messages, mailings that show you know, which of your neighbors voted, a lot of things that have been proven actually to, to work and are, and are apparently widely known in the industry. I'm sure they'll be used in 2020. So they did a pilot experiment in six states in 2018 just to see if it worked, and uh, even in the pilot study, they created 60,000 new voters uh, in their pilot study who had never voted before, who now look like they're on track to become environmental voters. So now they're scaling this to the 50 states. Uh, now, uh, in, the, in the pilot study, they figured out it cost $25 to create a new environmental voter, which uh, apparently, this is not my world, it, it, in, in the world we live in is really cheap. Now, this was eye-opening to me, but for example, uh, it turns out there's one PhD scientist in Congress. His name's Bill Foster. And he's actually the one who explained the, the, the nuclear physics of the Iran <laughs> nuclear deal to the rest of Congress. Uh, but I saw him before the 2018 election. He was doing a fundraiser in Brookline because he got his PhD in physics at, uh, at BU. And I said, so by the way, do you think you're going to get reelected? And without missing a beat, he said, absolutely, absolutely I'm going to get reelected. And I thought it was because of the blue wave or you know, something he had heard. And he said, the reason I'm going to win is we've modeled it and my opponent would have had to have spent $40 million to beat me, but he's only raised 20 million, so I win. That, sadly, is the world we are now living in. By the way, of course, he won. Because that's, so a lot of this comes down to dollars and who you can get to vote. That's the bad news, but the good news is if, if, if the Environmental Voter Project is right, there are millions of potential environmental voters who maybe with a little coaxing my vote. So this is one area I'm hopeful about, and I'm, I'm making some modest uh, contributions to that group, which, as far as I know, is nonprofit, and I have no financial interest whatsoever in the Environmental Voter Project. Uh, the other was I went to a meeting in, uh, in Geneva shortly after the Paris Climate Summit, uh, and there were a number of uh, big money managers and hedge fund kind of people there. And, and what they were all talking about was the unintended consequence, or one unintended consequence of the Paris climate change. Uh, or the Paris Climate Summit, was that all these people who are managing billions and billions and billions of dollars were saying, what if they're right? You know, even as a risk mitigation strategy, we got to start pulling more resources from, you know, carbon-based fuels into alternatives, and we have to start making investments and as though the scientists are actually right. So uh, the take-up from that was uh, maybe uh, free market forces will come <laughs> to the rescue here, and money flowing in the right areas will expedite things. Uh, and then the, the last thing, and I'm not sure if this is an optimistic thing or a pessimistic thing, and this is where I'm going to get myself excommunicated. Uh, a, a lot of scientists I've spoken to think, you know, it's all well and good. You know, we, we get off fossil fuels faster. We use, you know, paper straws. We do, you know, we drive a Prius. We do all the things that make us feel good. But if we don't change the, the curve in terms of population growth on the planet, there are many who fear it will all be for naught in the end, that we just won't be able to engineer our way. Now, the, the rosiest view is that 
you know, the engineers will come to the rescue and we'll figure out. But if you just look at environmental denigration related to, you know, overpopulation, I think we have to revisit uh, our approach to, uh, uh, you know, birth control, et cetera, if we're ever going to change the shape of that curve. But that, at, least, at least that's within our control, I think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you both. Now I think it's fair, uh, fair play for you to ask me a question, or you can just let me, you know, yap here for a minute. Either, either way. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the opportunity. Yeah, she, 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 you can tell she's raring, raring for this one, I think. Uh, well, Ari, you have seen this field unfold in uh, the many years that you've worked on it. So I was curious just to give the audience a little perspective on how you've seen the movement change, mm -hmm. and especially kind of relative to recent times. And then perhaps uh, the more important one is where do you think we need to move uh, in the near term? Huh. Uh, Small question. Well, I, I'll see how I can answer that in two minutes or less. So the first person who taught me anything about uh, climate change was a guy named Stephen Schneider. Uh, Steve Schneider, among the sort of scoundrels we hear about in the news and all the craziness of the world, it's hard to account for people like Steve. Uh, and um, he was on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson in the 1970s talking about climate change. He did get booted off because on, I, he had been on multiple times and the last time he went off script and evidently that was a total non-starter. Um, and he was one of the first people along with Jim Hansen to really do modeling of the climate system at scale. And that was a remarkable thing to do in the 1970s when computers really were not anything close to what they are today. And even then, and frankly, 150 years before, without computers, scientists had the sense, knowing physical principles of the atmosphere, this was going to be a problem. And at that time, I remember him very clearly uh, in one of the lectures he gave, talking about what he called the double ethical bind of being a climate scientist. And by that, he meant that scientists have an ethical responsibility to science, meaning that you don't make stuff up, you do your experiments well, you have it peer reviewed, you, you do your level best, knowing we're imperfect beings, to get what you're doing right. And that is your ethical responsibility to science. But then he said there's a problem, because when you're engaged with climate science and you understand what I understand, you kind of also have not kind of, you definitely have, he would say, an ethical responsibility to the society you're living in, which is if my science is saying that we're going to fundamentally transform human civilization, it's probably important for me, who has done these experiments, to figure out a way to get people to understand this so that we can do stuff about it. And one of the things, and to your question, Renee, that I've noticed in, in the progress since that point to today is, is that bind has been getting pulled harder and harder. We hear climate scientists, some of the best in the world, talking about storms like Sandy or the wildfires in Australia right now and being enormously responsible to science, saying we cannot say, given the science we have, that we know that climate change is quote unquote causing individual events. They will then proceed to say, but what we know from climate science is making the risk of these events more likely. So this is sort of a vision of the future. So maybe 10 years ago, no, it's hard to keep track of time. 15 years ago, I was at a meeting with Corey Dean. Corey Dean was at that time the science editor for the New York Times. The, the, you may know that the Tuesday edition of New York Times sort of sets the science reporting agenda for the world. So what they report on generally goes through the media just like everywhere. And she was addressing this very issue of, and this is a long time ago already, but scientists saying, you know, this event we can't say is caused by climate change, but we can say that this is probability. And she looked at all of us, she said, as a journalist, I'll tell you as an editor, the best way to make sure that I as an editor will not let that get into print and be sure that no one reads it is to insert words like maybe, yeah. probably, there's an increased risk. Because it turns out that outside of scientific circles, and arguably sometimes within scientific circles, probabilistic events are essentially lost on human brains. And we know this from experiments. We, we, there's tons of experiments showing that human beings just, we, we have a terrible time understanding risk. 
And so we ran into this conflict between what science and ethics and science dictated and ethical responsibility to society. And so even in the best case scenarios where people are really concerned, they hear scientists stand up and say, well, we don't know for sure whether climate change is doing this. And this is to your point earlier about language. Right. And now we have a whole group of other people entering the conversation on climate change. And, and speaking of progress, so the, the, the first event to my knowledge that dealt with climate change and health was at the Real Earth Summit in 1992. So Real Earth Summit is probably the most important international meeting on the environment in human history. Pretty much every head of state of every country was there. It was the starting point of the UN framework on climate change, which ultimately led to Paris. It was the starting point of the Convention on Biological Diversity and a whole host of major environmental initiatives that have had huge benefit to humanity. And one of my mentors and his colleague who founded the center that I now work at went to Rio and as two physicians held a, uh, an event which was titled, Where's Health at Rio? Because all of the conversation, this is 1992, around climate change was about polar bears are in big trouble, glaciers are melting, sea levels rising, but there was no human face to this. And from that point forward, the health community, and it was very slow at first, but these days it is not so much, and I'm very happy to see that, has increasingly become engaged. But now a different dynamic has emerged. So people like me who practice and do most of our uh, clinical work um, in that regard, uh, as a pediatrician in my case, we look at a patient in front of us and we say the patient has certain symptoms of an illness. We do tests to understand what the illness is. And at the end of the day, there is really in most diseases, arguably, and maybe in all diseases, no test that's 100% perfect for a diagnosis. And in my line of work in pediatrics, it's often way, way less. The certainty we have to treat diseases is, is you know, by probabilistic estimates, often around 60 or 70%. Take that example to a situation I deal with all the time, which is a baby, and essentially a baby under a month of age with a fever. So we know at a population level, a baby in the United States today with a fever has probably around a 10%, maybe a little less chance of having a bacterial infection. So there's a 90% chance that that fever is being caused by a virus and an eight or so percent chance that it's caused by a bacteria. Now, of those bacterial infections, the vast majority are from urinary tract infections, which are bad, but babies can be worse because they can spread from the bladder into the bloodstream and the spinal fluid. But of the scope of bacterial infections that are bad, they're the least concerning. A smaller percentage of bacteria is in the bloodstream. That's really not good. And then the smallest percentage is the bacteria in the spinal cord, and that obviously is not good either. So in this circumstance where we have data showing us that, you know, 8% of the time there's these bacterial infections, which could be life-threatening, what do we do? Do we say, well, we don't know for sure if this child's fever is caused by a bacteria, so let's do another experiment? No, that is not the perspective of the clinician. A clinician says, there's an 8% chance this child might die if we don't do anything. We actually know what to do. We're going to do it. We're going to do some more tests to get data to see where things head in the future. But we're going to take action right now because the costs of inaction are simply irresponsible. If any of you went to your doctor and they chose to do something otherwise, that would be malpractice. So now we have this view which takes a clinician's approach to something like climate change and sort of looks at the planet like it's a patient. I mean, if we had a planet B to go to, it would be one thing, and I know people want to go to Mars, and that's you know an interesting prospect, but right now, as Carl Sagan said, <laughs> this is our only home, uh, and we're not ready to pick up and move yet. And so one of the reasons I have been particularly interested, in, and, and we've worked, and Renee has really um, led this work, is to energize clinicians to apply our clinical mindsets to this problem to hold on to the other end of the ethical double bind to society on this and make the conversation use language that people will grab onto to understand that yes, we're not certain, but that doesn't mean that we should stop doing stuff. You would never want your doctor to do that. And in fact, if you let your doctor do that, you would right. hate your doctor. Right. Right. And so 
we're having a symposium on February 13th, uh, and it is, to my knowledge, the first one of its kind, where we have every major teaching hospital in Boston, that is to say all the Harvard-affiliated hospitals, MGH, Brigham, BI, uh, we have uh, Cambridge Health Alliance, we have Just Next Door Tufts, we have Boston Children's, we have Boston Medical Center, we have the University of Massachusetts. To my knowledge, this has never happened in history, by the way. These institutions generally don't get along very well. But on this issue, they have all come together and they're supporting a symposium to talk to clinicians about the climate uh, crisis. Because we, we believe strongly that when clinicians understand what's going on and what's at stake for the profession of medicine in our jobs, they'll be more empowered to speak about this very issue in the terms, hopefully, of maybe others that I just described. So that was more than two minutes. <laughs> but but uh, that's the trajectory I've seen. And, and there's a lot more to unpack there. But it's been an interesting, an interesting ride to be on. So it's, it's um, just past 720. So now it's time for you all to get together and uh, think about things you want to ask us. Uh, and uh, we'll take about eight minutes or so, I think. Peter, does that sound right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, just so people know, um, well, there's a sheet on your table really asking for some kind of information. So if we can do this for seven or eight minutes, we'll then come back and ask questions to the panel. And I want to let our streaming audience know that they can participate. There is a chat window. If you ask a question through the chat window, we will try to get your question uh, uh, answered as we get to the uh, panel discussion. So let's begin for seven or eight minutes and we'll get back. Thanks. <laughs> 
Okay. Can I have your attention? In the, in the interest of time, the discussions I can hear are going very well, but we want to get a lot of uh, questions to the uh, panelists. So we have people stationed with microphones. Maybe you can raise your hand if you have a microphone. If you have a question, please move to a microphone. And uh, given that we want to try to get a good number of questions, we'd ask you not to make statements, but really just ask a question so we can get our panel to respond to it, and we'll go from there. So please get up from your seat and go to a microphone. I think we have one right in the corner here. Go ahead, please ask a question. Okay, I can start talking. Yeah. Okay, um, we um, closed uh, Pilgrim uh, Nuclear, okay, back in, in uh, May. And um, what I'm wondering is um, that was 62% um, of our green energy here in Massachusetts. And if we're so concerned about climate change, why close that nuclear plant? when it had an a NRC license until 2032. Yeah, the question was, we closed a nuclear plant, the Pilgrim plant, which was a major source of electricity uh, and nuclear energy is generally carbon free. Uh, at a time when we're increasingly concerned about climate change, why would we do such a thing? Um, I'm happy to take a stab You're at that. Stab one. Them. Yeah. So this is not just true here in Massachusetts. This is happening around the country. Nuclear plants are being retired, and many advocates of nuclear look at this and say, "What? What's going on? Because we're trying to reduce carbon." And I think it's quite clear that in our electricity grid, the loss of that plant is increasing the consumption of fossil fuels, particularly natural gas, to replace it. So, from a carbon standpoint, we are increasing our emissions because of the loss of that plant. That's true in California, it's true in Illinois and other places. And the, there, there are two fundamental reasons that I know of, and there may be others, but one is that right now in energy markets, nuclear is being out, it is too expensive to operate. And so the use of natural gas is wildly less expensive and the reduction in coal use, so we have all these coal plants, they're being retooled for gas. And so from a strict current economic perspective, the operators of these plants are saying, it, we don't see the ability to make money using these nuclear plants. And that's why they're calling. It's not because they're unsafe. It's not because they've lost licensure. It's simply the economics. Now, the other fundamental problem is we don't, you know, you know we, we pay if we, uh, you know, damage property, right? If you have insurance, you damage property, we pay. If you cause harm, uh, we generally, in the United States, you know, there's laws someplace you pay. We are paying zero for the cost of carbon pollution, really, in the United States right now. And if we were, nuclear power would look a lot more attractive because, of course, it doesn't make carbon. So the other reason that nuclear plants are closing is because we're not paying the fair price of what we're doing to the environment. Okay, so, we have a, a chatting question, I believe. Uh, Alicia, do you have one from somebody outside? Yes, we have a question from the streaming audience. What medical problems do you anticipate seeing more of in the next five to 10 years? You go, Mel. So I realize the irony in this, but the way that I often describe our current understanding of how the climate crisis is harming health today is an iceberg. So we see what's above the surface, and this is the health burden that we currently understand. But what keeps me up at night is the largest mass underneath the surface of the water and what we don't yet understand. And so if you think about what we do know is that the climate crisis harms health through many pathways that we currently understand. And heat's kind of the one that we, I think we have studied the best. So I'm definitely very concerned about rising heat in especially in areas of the country that aren't used to being hot. So it's pretty clear, there's a study that came out last year that showed that if you look at when people start getting hospitalized, for heat-related illness, 
that, for example, in Oregon, which is typically cooler, it's like around actually 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So much lower, I think, when most people think about heat waves and extreme heat versus thinking about Arizona um, and kind of the Southwest when it's closer to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm especially concerned about areas that aren't used to having extreme heat. But it also harms health in, in numerous other ways. So you think about increasing pollen in the air, which is especially bad for people with asthma and other lung diseases. It, uh, there's climate sensitive, as we call, like waterborne illnesses and foodborne illnesses. <laughs> you think about the mental health impacts, um, kind of a broad, I mean, extreme weather is a big one. So obviously people who experience extreme weather can cause post-traumatic stress disorder, especially if you think about in children and kind of what those lost lasting effects will be in kids. Heat makes mental illness worse. And then you also think about kind of some of the social factors. So actually people are displaced um, as a result of climate change. Either, you know, you think about drought, um, driving places, people away from air, especially if they rely on agriculture um, for their way of life people who are displaced after extreme weather events and don't have the financial ability to kind of rebuild in that area. But I think, again, getting to sort of that mass underneath, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but there was a study that came out last year that showed that rising temperatures actually might make bacteria more resistant to antibiotics, which means that a doctor would give you antibiotics for an infection and it doesn't work. And that especially scares me as a clinician because if I think that a patient comes to me and they're ill and I want to give them antibiotics and it's not working and climate change is making that worse, then that's kind of multiplying these threats. So I kind of use that as an example about there's a lot that we don't understand. So thinking about where, you know, all of the stuff we know is going to get worse, uh, but I also am more worried about what we're going to learn as we face these challenges that are truly unprecedented. And if you think about, you know, as a clinician, we often kind of try to look in the rearview mirror to kind of predict what our practice and, and health harms are going to be. But we can't look in the rearview mirror anymore because what we're facing is unlike anything we've ever seen. Thanks. We have a question from the middle right here. Thank you. Uh, Renee, you've started addressing this, uh, but my table was just interested in hearing more about um, the original topic, uh, how climate change will particularly harm the poorest and most vulnerable. Um, so you've already started talking about health and displacement. I was just hoping to get a little more um, discussion on the original topic um, of the event. Thanks. She asked you. Well. <laughs> uh, okay, she's, she's departing. So, uh, you know, I think on, with environmental harms in general and certainly with climate change in specific, people whose health is already compromised are greatest at risk. So that's true of any existing disease burden, mental health, heart disease, lung disease. Um, these are the folks that climate change is probably gonna have the greatest effects upon. Um, and obviously as a uniform principle, the poor. And you know, the, the, so if you're looking for um, how this plays out and this sort of gets back to this question of, you know, are there gonna be new diseases? Maybe we'll see some infections that we don't see around here pop up. But largely what we're looking at are the diseases we know becoming harder to deal with. And so we look to the folks who are having the hardest time staying healthy, having the hardest time accessing healthcare. These are the folks who I am expecting to see. Now, as a pediatrician, I'm biased to the young, so there's evidence that particularly the very young are gonna have greater health concerns. Um, particularly around um, uh, birth, um, it turns out, um, and that's true in the United States as it is, and it's even more so true in low and middle income countries. And then the elderly are also as a group, uh, you know, much more at risk um, from any of the harms that we see coming, which is heat, uh, floods and droughts, hurricanes, wildfires, so forth. Is that helpful? Does that get closer? You lost your microphone. Yeah, I did. That's okay. I think we, oh, you're over. You moved. You're standing there. I see. <laughs> hey, Cole, you have a question over here. Hi. So I just wanted to mention the Environmental Voter Project. You can come to this corner. Uh -huh. yeah. Just happened to have some information. We didn't plan this in advance. <laughs> uh, but also information on legislation in the state of Massachusetts. There are some really strong efforts afoot to reduce the amount of carbon to price carbon 
However, some of the bills that are proposing this have to be out of their committees by February 5th, otherwise they die. Yeah. So please find some more information about that. Come over to the corner to the Boston Catholic Climate Movement section. But my question is, all of us are here because we're concerned about this, both concerned about the poor, concerned about our kids, our grandkids. So how do people deal with the psychological stress of such a, a problem? Uh, you know, I, I'm going to cheat and answer a, sl a, sl a slightly related question, which is, uh, I have to tell, I tell you that, you know, when politicians make statements and are making disparaging statements about, for example, climate science and climate scientists, it, it doesn't stop there. It, it's quite dispiriting across the scientific community writ large, because you begin to think your government doesn't actually believe in the value of what you're doing, which is to try to generate knowledge and, and find out what's actually true. You know, I had quite the opposite experience growing up. I, I was born in 1957, so in the in the 60s, the scientists and, and the engineers were, were the good guys. That's that's who we celebrated. Uh, so this has had a ripple effect beyond the climate change debate, and I think if we're not very careful, we may really negatively impact a generation that otherwise would have pursued careers in science and engineering. And and so I don't have an answer to your question, but it is having an effect. Uh, it, it 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 is demoralizing when you hear. Or, or leaders speaking the, uh, this way. And I understand I, I, there, there's a term coined for the same sense of anguish and despair in the general population that, you know, uh, this is bigger than what, what we, you know, can, can handle. Uh, but I, I do think part of the answer is voting and, and politicians. And, and uh, you know, I, I think collectively, hopefully, we can write, write the ship before it's too late. I should stop using shipping metaphors because they already <laughs> referred to the Titanic. But, uh, <laughs> You know, I, I think I think we have to be proactive. I mean, I think one response is to try to be more proactive and to do the things we can do, including voting. We, um, we, we, so the question couldn't be more important. So in this trajectory that I've seen, so when health got on the radar, it was all about scaring people. It's, this is gonna be really bad for health and we should worry about health and it's gonna be a problem. So I don't know how effective that was, frankly, but that was first week. And, and you know, having been here, I, you know, spend a good part of my time in admittedly doing that and realize in retrospect that might not have been the best use of my time because it is more and more clear that what we need to do is give people the actions that we can do to make a difference. So the best antidote I know to climate despair is climate action and particularly actions that benefit people's health right now. And this is one of the happy you know, coincidences of climate change, as I alluded to it before, which is that obesity is arguably the single largest health problem we face. There's all this conversation about how we're gonna pay for healthcare. There's no payment system that is going to work if we have, as people are suggesting, half the population in need of chronic medical services for most of their adult lives because they're obese. Um, one of my colleagues at Children's wrote, uh, did some analysis suggest that obesity may shorten the lives of this generation of children in the States, so it'll be the first generation with shorter lives than their parents. This is a big problem. Turns out the medical model for treating obesity doesn't work very well. We have a fantastic obesity clinic at Children's, staffed with some of the smartest people I know, and their ability to deal with obesity in that setting is extremely high. So what do we need to do? Well, it turns out that when you walk, and bike and use public transit, there's abundant evidence that all those things are better for your weight than sitting in a car for long periods of time. Uh, it turns out that many of the foods that are most carbon intensive are also pretty unhealthy for your body mass index. And you go down the road and you see that a lot of the actions we take to address climate change are actually getting at some of these health problems. Mental health, by the way, is a huge part of it. So, there, was a, there have been many of these studies, and this is probably the best, and these studies are hard to do, but looking at people's access to green space and their mental health outcomes. So the largest study of this kind was done on some, I think it's almost a million uh, Danish children over the period of a decade. The Danish health system is nice because you get address data all the time, you get lots of socioeconomic data, and because of satellites in that period, you can really assess what their green space would be at their home. And Remarkably, across a suite of mental health diagnoses, there was overall a 50% decreased risk 
of severe mental health diagnoses, excluding the diagnoses that have the strongest genetic components. Those were the most strong genetic determined. They had less of an effect. Those were historically less genetically determined, had more of an effect. Um, but the bottom line is the kids that had the most exposure to green space were substantially protected. So what does that mean? Well, we don't know the mechanism. It's possible some of that's from air pollution. We know the trees buffer air pollution. And there's a lot of research that needs to be done here. But it's pretty clear that we know that trees buffer air pollution. That's good for health. Uh, we, we know that access to green space is likely going to promote people going places on foot and by bicycle. Uh, we know that green space actually sequesters carbon dioxide. And, and so you realize that there are these benefits that come again and again. And, and to your question, these benefits, when these interventions are done in the most vulnerable communities, carry the greatest benefit. Where is there the least, least amount of green space in Boston? In our poorest neighborhoods, right? Uniformly, you see this time and time again. Now, we have, frankly, no excuse in Boston. In parts of the world where wood is a resource for energy, that's a different conversation. But um, the best antidote to climate despair is climate action, particularly when we put it in the lens of doing something that's going to matter to people uh, right now. Um, we have just started a whole initiative around mental health because we see it as such a crucial part of the climate conversation at this point, both in terms of the reality that we're going to probably need more mental health care, and there are people thinking about how we need to fundamentally retool how we deliver mental health care in the United States to meet the demands that are coming, which I'm happy to talk about, which is really interesting, but also to look at the climate solution space and say, how is this going to affect the mental health crisis we have right now in the country? Um, and, you know, no more uh, apparent now in substance abuse disorders, uh, which are also a major challenge. So. I'll just we have about 10 minutes to go. We have, we have a number of questions. So let's go right here and see if we can get one. Hi. Um, I had a question about how to move from the amorphous, everything is interconnected and you don't really know where to start and which part of the infection to treat aspect of the conversation, which I think, you know, we've, we've really gotten at, you know, here are all of these different things happening to what are the particular local organizations what are the particular pieces of legislative um, advocacy? Um, and what are some of the individual changes that you as panelists think are particularly effective ways for people to start um, to climate action? Um, and you know, that, could be, that could be the low hanging fruit of recycle more, use public transportation, but maybe there are more specific projects um, that are happening locally um, that you could uh, talk to us about so that folks have an opportunity to reach out, not just to the organizations that are here, um, but just generally in the community. And maybe there's specific studies that are happening that people want to participate in um, or outreach and public health programs, that kind of thing. So I'm interested in hearing about those kinds of specifics. So I can kick us off. I mean, I think the, the biggest way to get engaged in this is to talk about it. Um, Catherine Hayhoe is a, a renowned climate scientist and she talks about how we just need to talk about it. One, I think it's good too from the mental health standpoint because there's actually a name for this, eco-anxiety, so it's good to know you're not alone. But it's important to engage in that conversation because I think even my experience has been people who may even deny climate change, they still understand that something is different, right? No one can actually scroll since we digest our news now through scrolling, most of us. You, know, you can't scroll through your news feed without thinking that something has changed, independent of, again, whatever, even if people dispute causes. Which again, I think is very clear and there shouldn't be a dispute. But is just having that conversation and then also talking about it from a personal standpoint. So talking to your neighbors about it, forming community groups, and putting that human face of like how we're impacted because this isn't about polar bears or icebergs. I mean, this is about our children, our aging parents, and if that's not, you know, enough of a motivation, then about yourselves. And especially, right, for the poor and the fact that those that are disadvantaged and the vulnerable, that action on climate is actually action to address uh, those inequities. So by actually putting a human face to this, I think that can motivate action kind of within your community. And you can imagine, right, we need sparks and if you ignite these sparks then who knows where they're going to travel so you ignite one in your community in your book club at your church uh and then you know who knows where that's going to lead but i think the biggest thing is we you know we have the treatment that we need to actually cure this problem we just need the political will and so 
if we are in a democracy and it is the power of the people, then we should be talking to those that can make the systematic change that we need. Um, so I'll stop there. And well, the, the caution I've heard is that there are lots of things we can do individually to lower, for example, our carbon footprint. Yeah. And as Aaron said, some of them fortuitously align with things that are good for your health, such as eating less red meat. But that's necessary, but not sufficient if we're gonna tackle this problem. And there's a real concern that we'll feel so good about ourselves because we're doing those things that we don't do the things that are really in the end gonna make or break us. And so I love the discussion about uh, nuclear power because you said market forces are, not, are, not, are working against nuclear power, but they're also working against coal. Okay, market forces are really, really powerful. And as Friedman wrote in his book, the, the trick is to have enlightened leaders create policies that align the market forces to do what it is you're trying to accomplish. Now, that might be with a carbon tax, but there might be other clever ways to do it. But he pointed out that there were many times where it looked like alternatives were being developed and suddenly the, the rug got pulled out from under them because the price of carbon fell. But if we had put, places, you know, put in place safeguards so investors knew uh, that the price of oil, at least at the retail level, was not going to go below a certain level, uh, we would have been okay. So I think we need enlightened leaders, we need to vote, and we need policy. And I don't remember the specifics of acid rain, but I remember really being terrified of acid rain when I was in high school. But it seemed like with bipartisan support, we put new policies in place that, voila, got rid of acid, acid rain as a big concern. So I, it can be done, but we're not in this environment we are right now. I think we need more enlightened leaders. How about in the middle? Um, if the dangers of fire and flooding, other natural disasters are increasingly imminent and overwhelming the current systems, um, and you guys are working on kind of the big picture upstream, how do we better equip the general population to be those frontline first responders? Um, you know, does do we need natural disaster preparedness programs in our schools or communities? Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think this is a, and I, if I can take your question, particularly in the lens of, of kids, because, you know, specifically as to be doing, you know, what should we be telling our children more or less, or how should we be preparing our children and our communities? Um, you know, there's, uh, there's clearly a need both here and around the world to pay a, quite a bit more attention to the intelligent steps that would get people out of harm's way. And that could be from flooding, from fire. Uh, you know, one of the harder ones is food shortages and water shortages. Uh, but those things are, are sort of apparent. There's not a lot new in, in some ways about what you need to do around hurricanes, right? In the United States, there's, we know how to deal with that. The question is, is doing that. What, what, what I think is, and, and so the answer is yes, of course, we need more. There's, a lack of public health infrastructure directed at climate change. We can do much more to protect particularly vulnerable populations in coastal communities. We have a tremendous need to improve our heat messaging system. So the thing that Renee didn't mention is that not only do we see these different thresholds of where heat is at risk, but we know very clearly that the heat warnings are being given after the temperature is well above what we know causes harm. <laughs> so across the board, there's all kinds of stuff. And this is stuff we could do right now. And the question is, how are we going to spend money? The challenge becomes, there are two challenges I think about it. One is when it comes to these resilience measures, you can spend an awful lot of money building seawalls that don't get used for 100 years, yeah. right? So one of the fundamental challenges with these adaptation measures is hurricanes are probabilistic. We know they're becoming more dangerous with climate change. The worst ones um, are becoming more common, but overall Atlantic hurricanes are actually becoming less common, which is a misunderstanding out there, which um, I try and deal with, but you know, the storms that are happening. But you know, should we spend the several billion dollars to protect the back bay. And would that billion, and so you get into this problem with, with resiliency measures pretty quickly, which is, is that money better spent somewhere else? And so that's why, you know, from my perspective, there's, it's not a, if, uh, you know, a one-on-one -on -one exchange here. It's not every dollar in resiliency should go somewhere into mitigation, but we really need to think hard about how we can protect the most vulnerable first, which, if you look at a lot of the plans, that's not what's being done. So that would be the first pitch, which is let's look at where the risks are and figure out how to invest to protect the most vulnerable first. The bigger challenge is, is I think the one you alluded to about what we tell our children. So 
we're you know, worried now about talking about active shooter drills for our children, right? So what do we tell our children? We're telling them that there might be a shooter coming through their school to shoot them, which is a scenario that when I was growing up, you know, it was about as far from my mind as anyone could possible. And now my kids in school, and this is what I'm And so now we're talking about, should we be telling your kids what to do if there's a wildfire, you know, coming into the world? And to be clear, when Greta von Thunberg came to the United States, I saw a child who was watching the UN thing on the TV, and they heard Greta von Thunberg say the earth is on fire. And what did they cut to? They cut to pictures of wildfires spreading around. And the kid literally turned to their parents and said, is, is, is the world really on fire? And so you see very clearly that this becomes a real potential challenge to communicate to children in a way that is helpful. And so um, I think there are two critical pieces of that, which is one, there's no use in my mind of pretending that this isn't real children. So we've learned time and again in trauma in children, the worst thing you can do is pretend that is real is pretend. But the next part, so the, you know, this is a problem, it's a big problem, but you need to understand, number one, there are people around you who care about this and want to make a difference because we also don't want our children to be parentified. We don't want them to feel like, okay, we messed this up, now it's your job to fix it for us. And that here are, to the other question, here are the things that we can do as a family, in our place of worship, and so forth. And it turns out, when you talk about resiliency, and resiliency to anything, in a child's life, the single most important factor to a child being resilient to the threats from climate change, the prospect of violence in their community, the potential trauma that may come in a home, is having a stable, supportive relationship with an adult. It could be a parent, it could be a teacher, it could be a priest, doesn't matter that child needs to understand that there's someone in the world who has their back. And so when you, know, you talk about what resiliency is, that's, in my mind, makes, you know, if we're gonna invest in resiliency, that's what we invest in. We need to invest in the programs that help our children understand that in this world where things are happening that no one likes, there are people here who have their backs. So that to me is by far our best investment. Uh, and yes, we have to think intelligently about where to build seawalls. That, that's actually a much harder investment to figure out in my mind. Okay. Uh, we have a commitment here where we stop at 8 o'clock because we know there are people who need to leave. We're going to take one more question and then we'll end formally. But what we hope is uh, perhaps the panelists can stay a few moments and people can approach the stage. Uh, one second. We have a question over here. Okay, one second, please. I have a question right here. Um, so a lot of the climate change um, discussions are happening for the most part, from scientists. What, how do we get others involved, uh, artists or authors or other people who might be more influential to um, people that might be not believing or believing that it's a both sides issue? How do we get others who are not within the scientific community or scientifically literate or, and how do we move beyond just a both sides argument? So that, that sort of presupposes that there are a lot of people out there who haven't made up their, their mind, and maybe that's true, but my, my, my concern or sense is that a lot of people have made up their mind on one side or, or, or the other. Uh, but, but certainly, if there are people who have not made up their mind, there are some really wonderful sources of information, including sources of information that are lay-friendly to try to explain the, the nature of the problem. For example, there are some from the National Academy of Sciences that are geared towards lay people, but uh, there's, no, there's no shortage of, of information out there. Uh, and, and the one thing, to, as you're trying to help people make up their mind is, that, you know, I would just point out to them that scientists are like herding cats. You can always find a heretic, you can always find an outlier. Unfortunately, they sometimes wind up on cable news programs. But, you know, that, and that's, that's fine. Those heretics, you know, push us to think more deeply about what we've concluded. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, the vast majority of scientists think this is a problem. They've thought this for years, and it's not based on a whim or a belief. It's based on data and modeling that they've collected over decades. And we were saying offline, you know, one thing I read was just because there's uncertainty about how fast it's going to get bad and how bad it's going to get should not be a, something for provide reassurance. That, if anything, that should alarm us more. And I would just add that it's really important to make it personal to them. And in order to do that, you have to have a conversation, a thoughtful conversation. And I think we're currently in a cultural era where we're very good at talking 
but we're not as good at listening. And so if you can listen to what their perspective is, I think there's some common ground that you can come to with anyone, that you can find something that you mutually have a connection around or that you feel is important. And that can be a bridge to a discussion because I think people want to be heard. And in order for us to kind of figure out how to make it personal to someone, you have to learn about that person. So I'll just encourage everyone to have those conversations. Okay, we're going to formally end at this moment, but those who need to go can go, and then those who can stay, if our panelists will stay for a little bit, we can ask some more questions uh, up close. But I want to first just thank the panel that I think what we heard tonight was really an illuminating discussion about climate change. We heard it from a, a scientific perspective, from a faith perspective, and we learned that language is extremely important. We learned about a double effect of some of the people who are dealing with climate change. I mean, I want to just thank personally uh, the, all the panelists uh, for the, the input they've given us. And I think it really behooves us to think a little bit about what we're doing and what we can do. We do have the two uh, action groups here with us tonight. It may not be the answer to everyone's question, but if you come up and ask them, they may be able to uh, move you to some interest that you have. Uh, I also want to end by just saying again that we are dependent upon people like you to support the work we're doing so that we can continue. Uh, donations, there are envelopes on your table. You can make a donation by check. You can write your, uh, your credit card information. Or if you choose to swipe your card, your credit card, at the back, Emily is there. We can do that for you as well. The streaming audience, you can uh, donate online at uh, faith-justice.org. So with that, I'd like to ask you to please help me give our panelists a, a round of applause. Thank you. And, and finally, I thank all of you for being here. It does show there are interested people. There are people who want to live faith at a deeper level, and we are appreciative. Um, please come again. We'll have another meeting coming up in the next couple of months, and we hope to see you. So thank you very much, and thank you for being here. Uh, if you have questions, maybe come on up. If you're willing to stay a moment. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Well thank done. You thank so you very much. much. Yeah, Bill, really, it's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Okay.